Good. Well, good evening, friends. I'm super excited uh, about tonight. I actually am going to be speaking out of a passage, a story tonight out of the Old Testament. But before we start, I'm not going to tell you what that story is because I have a little riddle for you. Does anyone like riddles? Yeah. Does anyone like riddles? Okay. So, feel me out for this. Let's see what we get. So it says this. This story is truly timeless. It has stood the test of time, and yet it is time has long run out. Shout it out if you know the answer. So this is a story from the Old Testament. I'm going to split the room into two halves. So this half, you're Team A. See, say Team A. Team A, Team B. All right, I'm going to give you 15 seconds, actually. Not 30 seconds. To try and come up with, everyone gets an answer. Actually, you only get one answer as a team. What do you think the story is? So it's a story out of the Old Testament. Again, the story is truly timeless. It has stood the test of time, and yet its time has long run out. Shout it out if you know the answer. So you guys get together. Think about what it might be. You guys get together. I'll give you 20 seconds. And then we look. Numbers. No, no, no. It's a story, it's a story, not a book. It's a story. 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 Alright, eight more seconds. Story, anything related to time in which time happened? I mean, Aaron and uh, it has stood the test of time, and yet its time has long run out. Shout it out if you know. It's timeless. It has stood the test of time. It's a story. It's a very tricky, tricky that's, way of That's all the time you get to think about it. So do you have, I'll give you two answers. You get two answers, and you guys get two answers. So what do you want to go with? Story in, in scriptures, in the Old Testament. Yeah, when Joshua and Caleb laid, uh, oh, held their hands up so that the sun wouldn't yes. set. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Wow, that one was perfect. Uh, got an answer. Got an answer. Uh, yeah. I, uh, Samson. So no. what's about Samson? No. Okay. So last one. What's up? Hi. Um, it has stood the test of time. Creation? And yet, it's time as long as we're not shout. Creation's not out yet. Jericho. Jericho it is, my friend. Jericho wow. it is, my friend. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll explain it. Here it is. I, I, had, I walked this through with uh, Jericho. So the story is truly timeless. So it applies in all places. Its walls, the story itself, the walls have stood the test of time. The story of the walls, right? But the walls themselves have not stood the test of time, right? Because they have run out. That makes sense? Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So, and also the shout it out. I was hoping that, you know, the whole shout thing around Jericho would give away, but it didn't. So, the walls of Jericho. Did anybody watch VeggieTales growing up? Yeah. All right, so, yeah, so I was looking for images of Jericho, and to be honest, I think if I had this for 50 minutes, I would actually watch a lot more of this video because it explains it pretty pretty well. But just to give you an idea of where we're going with this, uh, I want to walk through the storyboard of Israel, where it fits in the context of Scripture. So what happened before this time in, in place with Israel, what kind of happened after a little bit. Um, and then I'll walk through a couple key phrases. So what happened at Gilgal, and then uh, some Passover things. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, we'll address Jericho, because that is kind of what the story is leading up to. Talk about the cessation of manna, why that might be important and significant for us. We talk about the promised land of Canaan, ancient city of Jericho, once again. And then come to a dialogue. Joshua has a dialogue with a man that I think is just really, really fascinating and hope that we can learn from. So I want to ask a question, who is he? And then we'll look at what it means to be on the holy ground and then come away with a theological application. So here's the text, Joshua 5. If you want to turn your Bible to Joshua 5, you can, or turn to your computer, whatever you want to work with. So I'm not going to read the text, but this is what's happened. Um, they have come through the Jordan River, and now they are in this land here, um, and this is where they're set up. But before we go further, I want to talk about um, this storyboard and where they're at. So before um, this happened, where were they? Egypt. Egypt. All right, what else? The desert. Wilderness. 
shout out. What else had happened prior to this? Crossed the Jordan. Crossed the Jordan. Okay, who is God using in, Mo in Egypt? Moses. Moses. So he used Moses. Aaron. <clears throat> and then you said the Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. Across the Jordan. Who did he cross the Jordan using? Who's the leader? Aaron. Um, Joshua. 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 All right, so this, I have a little map here actually I want to show. Here's the text that we'll come back to. Um, but Israel in context, I know you can't really see this very well, and I apologize for that. I was hoping the screen might be a little bigger. But you have the covenant, you have all these things, you have the Exodus up here, and God raises up judges right after this area. But you have this little pocket of time here where the conquest is being um, manifested. And so the next one I have here is a map. And I want to talk about the significance of Gilgal. Has anyone ever heard of this location before? Ever heard really about it? Yes. <laughs> what have you heard? Whatever. Whatever you got. Um, I think they found some remains of Jericho. Okay. Yeah, so it's a super important part of this story, the story of Jericho, that often I think gets overlooked. You have this really powerful narrative in Joshua 6, but often we kind of forget what happened right before. And so if you look at the map, it's kind of rough. Here's kind of the sweep of the conquest. They come here from the eastern side, crossing over the Jordan, making their way up um, into Gogol up there, which is not too far from Jericho. And if you'll remember, um, God helping them get through Jordan, they used the rocks. Remember, they used the rocks to kind of memorialize what they were doing and to remember the faithfulness and the provision of God to bring him, continually bring him from um, slavery into new places and towards the promise. And so it's really cool to kind of get an idea, an image of the miracles and the journey that the Lord took them. But just for geography's sake, you see how close this proximity is to Jericho. Now, mind you, before this, also, did, this, did the uh, Israelites get to go into the promised land right out of Egypt? No, right? They were wandering in the wilderness for quite, quite some time, right? And then they get a second go at it, right? And they send the spies in, and they come back with an unbelieving report, a negative report. And so uh, they're still outside of the city. They're still waiting for the promise. Uh, so you can kind of see here, this is the strategic location of Gilgal. But I think there's so much more to it. Uh, and it's, there's some pretty cool things. So this, the Hebrew verb for, that uh, sounds similar to Gilgal, is, is this word right up here. Um, and it means to roll. To roll. Everyone said to roll. Roll. And there's another similar uh, sounding word uh, that means wheel, gal gal, which they sound very similar in the respect to the geographical location. And so the thought behind this is uh, the wording, if you have to roll and then you have wheel, what do these, what do wheel, wheels do? Roll. And roll. How do they help cars get places, right? They, helps transport into new locations, right? So there's two different schools of thought of kind of why this might be significant, why this might be relevant to Israel being encamped in that location. Okay, so one school of thought is that God was uh, discouraging the reproach that the Egyptians wanted to cast over the reputation of Israel. So it's this time period where they're, they're living in this situation and God is rolling out, he's wheeling away the aspersions, in other words, just the, the negative connotations that Egypt wanted to mock God, all these different things. He's, he's taking, he's purging that away. Another thought is that you have the unbelieving generation that did not give a good report. They also didn't get to see the promised land and they died out. So in both senses and cases, God is rolling away the reproach of the unbelieving generation and of the Egyptians, which I think is super fascinating because you, you think of this location as a preparation and a kind of a purifying environment. Also, during the time in this text, in chapter 5, the Passover is celebrated again and circumcision is reinstituted as the covenantal sign of relationship between Yahweh and Israel. Also, if you look at the parallel in the New Testament, we're not going to go there, but circumcision and uh, Passover both have their parallels in the New Testament where you have the believer's baptism um, and you have the 
the Lord's Supper, the celebration of the redemption, redemption from bondage. And so it's cool to see that this location, before they're entering into the promise, sets up the people of Israel to receive what God is waiting to do for them. And so it's cool to see that. Let's just look at the ancient city. As you can see, it's a pretty big city. Um, it was basically unimpenetrable. It was a safe haven. Not much could really enter in. And in even chapter 6, the beginning, it says now, Jericho was shut up. And they, there was really not a way in. And so this is, a, this is the promise of God waiting in the walls for them to, to breach. Uh, some studies even say some of the excavations found walls to be even five feet thick. So just a massive place. And Jericho was also one of the oldest cities uh, and earliest cities to be established. Let's go here. Going. So the man and the sword. So in the text, it says this, that Joshua, after they had moved, uh, their, you know, they've gone through the Passover, they've reinstituted the, uh, they've reinstituted the circumcision, that he found himself on a hill and he looked and he saw a man with a sword. It's pretty fascinating. A man with a sword. And he approaches him and he says, he basically says, are you for us or are you against us? Are you on our team or are you on their team? And the individual who says, this. He says, no. That's not really an answer that he was looking for. But he says, no, but I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Just stop right there. Who do you think this individual is? Let me see if I can skip back real quick. So, we think he's Jesus. Who else might he be? Gabriel. Gabriel. What about other thoughts? Do you guys know what theophany means? Theophany is... So theophany is a, is a spatial and temporal um, manifestation of the presence of God in a tangible form. You know, it's taking place through scripture. So is this God taking on this theophany in the presence of Joshua? Who else might he be? If he says, I'm a commander of the army of the Lord, some translations, some scholars say, we call him the prince. Who might else he be? Could be Michael. Could be Michael. So let's just write angel. The point is, as Joshua comes to an understanding, that there is a difference in rank. So Joshua is leading the army you know, of Israel. He's leading. He's God's chosen leader. And yet he comes to this encounter in the text with this man with a sword. And he says, hey, are you for us? Are you against us? And the guy says, no. That's pretty confusing. I'd be like, you're the army. You run the army of the Lord, but you're not for us. And so what this individual was saying, this man was saying, was, I'm not just playing on your team with man. I'm, I'm, my orders come directly from Yahweh. And so it's interesting to ask this question, well, who really is this man? And I, you know, it's hard to come up with a definitive answer. It seems as though Joshua, when he bows down to him, he bows in reverence and says, what do you want to do, my Lord? What should I do? And the terminology that he uses would not be my Lord in the sense of God most high, but of more of a call to respect. But it's significant that even though he bows down, this individual does not stop the worship. And so there's a, a German scholarship that says basically he, Joshua was aware that he was in the presence of God, but he was also at the same time not equating his bowing down to this individual being God, which is, which is interesting. And he goes on to say, uh, let's see if I have a slide. He goes on to say, take off your sandals for the ground your sandals hold. Where have we heard that before? The burning bush, which is really interesting because Joshua is the successor of Moses, correct? He's the successor. He has taken on the mantle, just as Elisha took on the mantle of Elijah. He's taken on this mantle, and now he comes into a conversation with this very particular and peculiar individual who doesn't give him the facts, doesn't really explain much about who he is. He just says this one line, but he doesn't go into the details or the necessary things that Joshua was most likely wondering. I don't know about everyone else here, but if I was Joshua, I would have been like, who'd you say you are? Where'd you come from? Where are you going after this? Uh, all of these kinds of questions. And so whether it's Jesus, the pre-incarnate work of Jesus, or an angel, the point is that Joshua came into an understanding that he was in the presence of someone that was outranking him and he submitted to it with, without asking too many questions. Later on in the chapter, uh, or this, in the beginning of chapter 6, 
he then says, I'm giving you Jericho. I'm giving you Jericho. And so this is a question I want to propose to you from, from this dialogue. What are some of the theological implications that we can gain from this dialogue? So Joshua comes into this conversation with this man who clearly is not just another man from Jericho, not another man from Israel, but has and carries the presence of God. So what are some things that we can take away from this? Here's what I was thinking earlier. I think that sometimes we come into situations where we want more answers than we're given. And I think as believers, we need to be able to discern the presence of God in a location without having to know all the facts. Mm -hmm. So as we've heard tonight, he was given the orders, and then he was commanded to just go and do it. He didn't, Joshua didn't get to ask all the questions he probably wanted to ask. And at the same time, this individual, the presence of God, reminded him and reaffirmed him by saying the same phrase that he told to Moses. I've chosen you for this purpose to do what I've called you to do. And sometimes I think that God wants to work things out in the spiritual, and we have to work things out in the spiritual before they'll manifest in the physical. And so that's my really encouragement tonight, is, is when we don't have all the facts, can we look and discern the presence of God in a way that leaves us saying, God, I trust you, even though I don't have all the answers, but Jericho, the promise still awaits. And we're going to go after it and get it. Mm -hmm. So I got for you, friends. Okay. All right.